I'm joined here on the Managing Violence podcast by Dr. Lorraine Sheridan. Lorraine, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you, sir. It's a great honor. Uh, Lorraine, you and I have been connected for a while. Uh, we we started setting this up. I don't know, it feels like a, an ancient lifetime ago, but but we've managed we've managed to make it happen. And uh, yay, pretty, pre, pretty exciting. Uh, so uh, to save me introducing you, uh, because I will miss something. Can you give us, I guess, the the two minute snapshot of who you are and what you do? Yeah, 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 yeah. I am Lorraine Sheridan. I am an expert, apparently, in stalking and harassment and threats and all different forms of violence and family violence. And I started as a forensic psychologist 25 years ago. So it's my silver anniversary. There you go. And I moved to Australia from the UK 10 years ago today, according to Facebook, actually today, which is pretty exciting, isn't it? And I've been an academic for a long time, just jacked that in finally, liked it, but onto new things. But really, I'm a forensic psychologist and I'm a risk and threat assessor, interested in all the things I just mentioned. I've worked with the police in the UK and Australia and beyond on individual cases of things like stalking and threats and also on more general strategic stuff and policy. And I've done heaps and heaps of research. And if you're a research oriented person, you can find all this stuff on Google Scholar, all kinds of criminal justice stuff. But stalking is really the number one thing that I've spent the most time on. That is awesome. Uh, so if you, Lorraine is sort of, uh, I asked her to give the very short version, but you've got over 100 published articles, is that right? And, and, and five books, is that, am I, am I right on my numbers there? Something like that. I don't actually keep a count, but yeah, that, that's, oh, about, that's, that's about the ball field, the ballpark. That's incredible. That's crazy. Uh, and I, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't blame you for uh, for throwing in the academics after that many articles. I mean, really, what's, where's the return after you've already got a hundred? I mean, you've, yeah, exactly. What, what's the point anymore? Yeah, no, but I'm still going to do it because I've got an inquiring mind, Joe. I'm like you. I know that you're the same. You know, we're both the kind of people, aren't we? We look at something and then we can look at something else. And then we look about 55,000 other branches. And then we end up wanting to do PhDs on 26 different topics. So, you know, it never ends, does it? True. Yeah. So on that point, um, why one of the things that we've never really covered in depth on this podcast, and we're at episode 103 or so, one of the things that we've never actually covered in depth is stalking. So <gasps> when, when I first came across you uh, through APATAP, so the Asia Pacific Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, if you're listening yeah, yeah, yeah. around the world, then go find your local TAP and join them. They're a great resource. Go, go, go. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you were the president of APATAP at the time, and I, and I Googled you, and I found your your scholarly, scholarly uh, I guess, bio, and I thought, I need to have this woman on my podcast. Ah. I want to know about stalking. So, uh, and as it turns out, so does everyone else we listen to, because I put the call out in the... Uh, the Managing Violence Tribe on Facebook, and yeah. it went gangbusters with some fantastic questions. So I'm barely going to do any work whatsoever on this podcast. Yeah, hey. I'm just going to keep throwing questions at you because the listeners had really good stuff to ask. So uh, first question for you, I guess to set the scene. Yeah. What is the difference between stalking and, let's say, lesser forms of behavior, or maybe we might call it persistence <laughs> or harassment. Like, what, what's, how do we define the term stalking? Can I just roll you back very, very, very quickly? Two things from your lovely preamble. Number one, it is a crime that um, we've not looked at stalking before on your fine, fine, fine podcast. And I'll tell you why. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the UK Home Office, all different places around the world, it's about one in five women and about one in 16 men will experience stalking at some point in their life. Another thing I wanted to say is that your Facebook group is fantastic. The people in it are brilliant. They really, 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 really are sharp. They're fantastic. So this brings me to definition. You know the story, anything, you know, that goes near psychology, you get a million different psychologists coming out with so many different definitions. But stalking really is a range of behaviours where one person inflicts on another repeated unwanted communications. Mullen and Pathé, that's their parapsychiatrist, very fine people from the East Coast of Australia, that's their definition. And the really integral part, as you picked up, is persistence. 
But as you say, it's ridiculously difficult, particularly in the early stages of a case, to prize stalking apart from, say, sexual harassment, race-based harassment, bullying, all different stuff. Also, stalking can follow some other crimes and it can also be a precursor to other crimes. But the real heart of the matter is, as you say, persistence. And it's a whole range of behaviours where somebody just won't leave the other person the hell alone. They will not go away. And when we look at things like bullying, yeah, we can say that's pretty similar. But people are normally bullied because of one particular feature physical appearance say or their membership of a group let's say and sexual harassment tends to be just about one particular person's sexual attribute so it's all basically around you know what what the harasser would like to do to them and all that absolute nonsense so stalking is more persistent generally than you know it's brothers and sisters out there you know bullying and sexual harassment and the like And the other big issue in terms of defining it and prizing it apart is its relationship to domestic and family violence. Nearly half of all stalking cases actually follow a case of domestic or family violence. See, people think, don't they, that, yeah, generally people on the ground, not not the, not the fine listeners that understand all this stuff, but people generally think that if you've got a domestic violence case and then it ends, that's the end of it. But those of us that actually work properly on the ground, we know, don't we, that it often evolves into something else. Because if you've had your claws into somebody for weeks, months, years, decades, and then they get free, your investment has gone up in smoke. So what are you going to do? You're going to go from domestic violence to stalking to keep your control. So, yeah, a lot of similarities with other stuff, but important differences, too. So what we tend to say nowadays is domestic violence, generally, when the relationship's intact, ex-partner stalking is pretty much the same bloody thing, but it happens when the relationship's ended. Mm. There's a, there's a lot I'd love to pull on there, and, and we will run the risk of doing a three-hour show. Uh, <laughs> there's so many things that come up in the questions that I know there's going to be tangents I want to go down, but I'm going to try to keep myself disciplined and, and try to try to run a good show. Yay! Because uh, so, <laughs> because you're a, you're a mad person, and uh, and if, if I don't keep if I don't keep you online, nothing's going to happen. So. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, we'll be here for three days. I could just go. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> I love it. Um, I want to, want to just draw upon that because the uh, the ex partner aspect and the continuation from domestic violence. So yeah. a story I, I don't think I've ever shared on the on the show. I might have alluded Ooh. to, it, but uh, my my mother she got married very very young to yeah. uh, her first husband, not my dad, uh, but she got married very young to my to her first husband uh, who was much older than her. Moved out of home, had a bunch of kids really young, uh, and had a you know, pretty, pretty bad domestic violence relationship throughout her late teens, early twenties into her uh, mid late twenties. But yeah. every time she tried to escape and then becoming a stalking situation where he would follow mm-hmm. her and find her and didn't matter what's moving States with three kids didn't stop him. He'd always, Aww. which considering it was the seventies and early eighties is kind of, you, you would think that'd be easier to disappear, but, uh, but um, that was definitely the progression. It went from violence and control to stalking and fear yeah. and, until it came back, they would come back home and they'd end up back in a, in a violence and control relationship. So with, with stalking, is it, and, and there might be a difference here between uh, say stalking of uh, high profile people versus stalking relationships, but do you yeah. think it's mostly about control? Is, is it, is it a control and power thing or is, or is it different from case to case? It differs from case to case, but in ex partner cases, it is overwhelmingly about power and control. And Also, when you add into that, it's a horrifically toxic mix because you've got people that just cannot deal with any kind of rejection or slight. You see this with the other stalker types as well, which I'm sure we'll get into soon. But it's rejection and loss of power and control. Simple as that. Absolutely simple. And then they've got that great big injury, you know, the the big psychological injury. Everything I work for, it's all gone. It's all over. I have to reestablish that control. I have to get my power back. And the really, really kind of miserable thing about it is, is when you look at it from the perspective of the abuser perpetrator, 
you kind of get where they're from, coming from because they perversely feel that they're being controlled. And I'm really sorry that your mum had to go through that. Is she all right now? Yeah, no, she she met uh, my dad and they've been together for a long time now. <laughs> Nearly 40 years, so they're doing all right after that. But, uh, but yeah, it was uh, it, it, certainly, it certainly left a mark, on, obviously, on her life, but also my yeah, my siblings' lives, um, who were little kids during that process. Yeah, the ones that had already been born, exactly, because it does, like, you know, the impacts are massively long-term, even permanent. But, yeah, and so these perpetrators, you know, it was probably the case in your poor mum's case that he felt that your mum was controlling him because he's got this need, you know, to assert his power, his authority, his control over her. She's gone off to another state. She's disappearing. And he sees that as, oh, you know, she's given me the runaround. How very dare she? All I did for her, you know, her kids are my kids. You know, everything I put into her, all that effort, my life is wasted now. And I'm just feeling this massive psychological discomfort, this huge psychological, emotional pain. And if she would just stop running around, see sense and come back to me, I would feel better. She is the one that's giving me the trauma, the pain. It's all her fault. Mm. I'm the victim. Your mum is the one that's doing the bad stuff. So you get it when you kind of reframe it like that. And that is what they say. Because when I've interviewed them, as I have hundreds of times in various contexts, you know, they'll always start off by saying, oh, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I see what I did wrong. But then you scratch the surface a bit. You know, you use your little interview techniques, you get talking. And this is the narrative that tends to come out. She controlled me or he, you know, because it can be the other way around as well. But, you know, it was them that asked for it. They absolutely caused this and it's in their power to stop it. They're the only ones that can put this right. Nothing to do with me. I'm the victim. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. But we, because I know we'll, we'll know we'll circle back to different types of stalkers, but just to sort of, uh, I guess, round out uh, some of the differences early on. Uh, how does that differ with like with, with the infatuation stalker or someone who's who's just, yeah, the, I guess the Hollywood stalker, where someone just sees someone from a distance and they 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 fixate on them. How common is that, and how does that how does that differ in terms of the psychological rationale behind the stalking? Yeah, you totally picked up on fact a minute ago. I think I think you you already knew that the public figures. It just tends to be a different dynamic altogether. You know, the whole Hollywood people. It, that might be that they actually believe because majority of you know stalkers who stalk normal people non-celebrities are not terribly um high in terms of mental illnesses diagnosable mental illnesses but the people that tend to go after your public figures they're far more likely to be diagnosed with a mental illness a psychotic one for example and there's a group of public figure stalkers that genuinely believe that the person that they're in love with up in hollywood or whatever loves them back or would if they got the opportunity to do so. So they actually they believe be in a relationship. Hey, hey. Or they need to be rescued. Like exactly. That. Or they need to be rescued from the clutches of that terrible other Hollywood celebrity that they live in this glamorous life with. So they need to rescue. Or there may be a grievance or a grudge. And, you know, that public figure may really exemplify every problem that this stalker individual has got in their life. But the majority, as I say, of people that stalk everyday, regular human beings, the majority are not mentally ill at all. Mm. They've just got problems with rejection and power. And then you come, right, say, to your infatuation kind of harassers, as we call them. And, you know, again, they tend to focus on normal people in the main. And they're often people that just don't have really, really good social skills. You know, so they find it, they just don't know kind of the norms of courtship for one reason or another. And they they often, at least in the early case, stages of a case, look identical to the more dangerous types, but they're often relatively harmless. But then equally, again, we've got the really, really, really serious stalkers. You know, there's all different stalker typologies out there, but there's some that I call the sadistic tub, subtype that they're the ones that kind of like, you know, go, you know, depend on the age of the audience here, fatal attraction, that kind of thing, you know, whereas somebody's life becomes quarry and prey, they're cruel and they really do abuse your pets, like the famous bunny boiler in the film Fatal Attraction. They absolutely just treat it as a big game. And these people can be very, very cold, very clinical, very psychopathic and incredibly dangerous. But 
again, they don't look that different in the early stages to the far less dangerous ones. And that is difficulty, Jack. Yeah, that's, that's that's really fascinating because I, I think it's it's something that certainly came up as a topic of interest uh, when, we, when we put out the call for what questions do you have? And um, it just about how, how do you tell whether someone is going to be just an annoyance? Are they just going to be someone who sends flowers once a month? Are they going to be someone who just wants to say hello? Or are they going to be someone who might actually cause harm and might have you know, ambitions for violence? Or they're going to, they're, they're literally getting off on the fear as opposed to an actual outcome. Um, yeah. So what are some of the warning signs that you identify as a, as a threat assessment professional, if you're coming in to look at a case um, and trying to figure out whether, like, what sort of response does this need? Like, what are some of the warning signs for the, the more serious or more dangerous ones? Yeah, because as you say, some people, if we warn them off, got, you know, kind of elevate the cognitive element a little bit, you know, explain to them the impacts of what they're doing and how it's wrong and quite possibly illegal and very upsetting. Sometimes they really will just go, oh, gosh, yeah, you're right damn I'm so sorry bye and withdraw and then you might get a couple of kind of needy messages going oh I really am sorry but you know do you want to meet up for a coffee to talk about it but you know most of the time they will actually withdraw so there are some really good um publications and kind of um risk assessment tools out there but they tend to all look at the same core behaviors or kind of kind of core warning signs and end of tether as it is for so much you know risk and threat assessment in violence is a massive one has this person really reached the end of their rope so if they're an ex-partner person have they lost custody of the kids have they had the house sold you know in their opinion from under their feet unfairly have they fallen into drink have they lost their job are they absolutely at the end of their rope and they've got nowhere else to turn that is the reddest of the red 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 bright red flags and that also applies equally in um, the public figure cases as well. You know, if they've been done a few times, they've been warned, you know, they've had people that um, they love and care about, you know, they all know about it. They've got a criminal record now, but they've still got this belief that they have to have some kind of communication with a celebrity that this will save them somehow but again you know they, they've they've lost face and also they've lost money they've invested they have invested a lot into this that is a massive massive red flag as well other red flags is they just won't go away no matter what happens they just won't go away and why won't they go away it depends doesn't it because you know the sadistic worst ones they won't go away because they're enjoying themselves you put a big obstacle or a legal challenge or a physical distance challenge in my path i will show you how ace i am at clambering over that obstacle it makes it more fun because now that now they know there's a there's a chase yeah game on yeah i'm enjoying this i finally have a worthy opponent but others you know no matter what criminal justice measures or otherwise are put into place particularly your ex-partner stalkers they just won't go away you know this is really detrimental to their daily life you know the stalking itself is and also the repercussions from criminal justice from their employer and otherwise but they just will not go away i mean they're probably your two biggest red flags and then others horses for courses as usual it depends on the kind of case that we're looking at and you know and there's huge differences that you identified before between your public figure cases and your non-public figure cases i'm sure you've heard of them um, the calhoun distinction between hunters and howlers yep yeah a lot of your listenership will know that won't they People, you know, if you haven't if you haven't read uh, calhoun's hunters and howlers go get that book it's on the it's on the uh, recommended reading list on the website so go do that yeah man 10 stars out of 10 from me and so what the kind of accepted wisdom obviously a general accepted wisdom but you know and it is borne out by the data as well is that hunters rarely howl and howlers rarely hunt meaning that people howl away threats and they're not going to carry them out they're just high talk but hunters you know you're more careful predatory threateners they might drop a few little hints along the way on their pathway to violence but sometimes they're completely silent. That doesn't always apply very much in stalker cases. 
it applies in lots of things, but in particularly ex-partner stalker cases, what we've found over the years, again, only general, but what we've found is that the ones, the ex-partner cases that make really specific detailed threats, particularly with a particular mechanism involved, say for instance, okay, Louise, if I see you with that Dave fellow again, I will set fire to you both. You know, a really specific threat. They do tend to carry those out. They actually do. Because they're so, so sure of what they're doing is right because of their own kind of like, you know, the perverse victim mentality that I went on about. And they just feel that there is no other option. They're just so entitled. It reminds me of something that uh, I heard years ago in a, a breakfast presentation I went to from a former CIA interrogator. Oh. She, she said that um, the, the most startling revelation she had when she first started, uh, she was uh, working in various detention centers, interrogating terrorists, uh, terrorists and suspected terrorists. Uh, and she said the, the most startling re revelation she had early in her career was realizing that every single one of them thought they were the good guy. Every single one of them thought uh, that you go. What doing was justified. It was right, even though the, the means were questionable and a bit icky that it was something that was, the ends justified the means because of the grave insult that had been done to them or to their communities or to their religion or to whatever. Uh, and that was what, what was the motivating force. And she said that over the course of her career, then that became apparent in pretty much every premeditated violent crime is that everyone still thought they were the good guys. They were the good guy all along. That's fantastic. And what a beautiful, simple way of, you know, this fine woman telling you this, that, that's just absolutely fantastic. I love that. And yet we see this, stalking is absolutely no exception at all. I mean, other red flags as well. And that is a big red flag in itself. You know, I think I'm the good guy. I really do. You know, so unrepentant, absolutely unrepentant. You know, when I've interviewed stalkers, again, I've sat down with them sometimes and been a bit tricky. And I've given them an outline of a case. And I've said, you know, a stalking case. And I'll say, what do you think of that? They'll go, that bloke's a maniac. He's a nutter. You know, he wants locking up. And I say, ah, I've tricked you, mate. You know, I've just basically described what you're doing. I've just reframed it a bit. They go, no, 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 no. I'm the good guy. I'm totally justified in what I'm doing. The fault lies with the victim. What choice did I have? Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Other red flags along these lines, you know, along with the whole unrepentant thing is just unrelenting anger. Absolutely unrelenting anger. And again, that's part of the justification, isn't it? I'm just so angry. I've got to do something about this. And it's the whole obsession as well. And that is something that's really, really, really quite particular to stalking in many ways. You know, the whole world is seen through the lens of the stalking. Mm -hmm. You know, they put a game of football on the telly. Me and I used to watch football or me and I could be watching that together. See if, you know, an advert for a holiday, we should be on that holiday together. I bet she goes on holiday with a new bloke. Everything reminds them on it. They cannot focus on anything else. Another red flag we tend to see is that these people tend to have a history of relationship problems. You know, they'll fall out with their mum, their dad, their neighbours, their boss. And funnily enough, it's always everybody else's fault. It's funny old world, isn't it, that you can meet 7,452 people and it's always their fault that you don't get on with any of them. Funny, isn't it? You just had 10,000 listeners start flagging the <laughs> ex-partners, -ex uh, as you said that, because I'm sure yeah. if, if everyone has someone in their life, they're like, oh, yeah, that's you just described that 100%. <laughs> um, yeah, we know that person. We yeah, know that yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. That, we all know somebody like that. It's always everybody else's fault, isn't it? On, on, that, on that piece about the sustained anger, I've, I've been curious because I've, I've heard, uh, I've worked uh, on and off with domestic violence shelters and so on uh, over the years. And Good man. Yeah. yeah, you hear a lot of, I guess, uh, con conventional wisdom solutions to problems where you you just don't know whether it's born out of statistics or whether someone's just heard that and they've passed it on. Uh, and, and one of the things that I've heard a few times is that you should just ignore stalkers because eventually they get bored and go away. From your experience, is that a strategy that's worth entertaining? Do, do, do stalkers go away when they're ignored? Is it a tiny percentage, a big percentage? Well, what do you think? They won't necessarily go away, but you're not feeding it a lot of the time. You know, so stalkers thrive, thrive, thrive 
on being responded to, to provoking a response. Let's look now in particular at non-ex partner cases. So people that are stalked by strangers or acquaintances, clients, customers, neighbors, whatever. In particular, they're good people to ignore because say that they phone you 70 times in one day, right? And you just answer the phone on the 70th call because you've had enough and you just want to say something because you're only human. The message the stalker gets is, ah, I have to ring Joe 70 times in a day. And then Joe will answer the phone and I will get what I want. So the majority, generally speaking, we would ignore. And it also helps in the criminal case as well. You know, if there is a criminal case right from the beginning, I ignored them. I did no wrong. I am the perfect victim because, you know, in real life, you know, there's very... Very, very rarely we've got a perfect victim and, you know, then an absolute evil offender. The truth is often, you know, a little bit kind of fudged, particularly in like long term cases such as stalking, where there can actually in some cases be, you know, a bit of trouble on both sides. But if we ignore them from day one then we can present a nice clean slate to the police. But some people just don't have an opportunity to ignore them. You know, you've been to the family court, you've told everybody what's what, and you've got 20% custody and your stalker's got 80%. How are you going to ignore them? Yeah. It's not going to happen, is it? It's absolutely not going to happen. And what if they rock up in the street and everybody's just told you, oh, ignore them? You've got no safety plan then, because my safety plan is, oh, I'm just going to so totally ignore them. But then they come and confront me after they've had a few drinks in the car park when I'm leaving work in the dark at 7 p.m. and I'm on my own, I've got no safety plan. So, you know, it, it is a bit of a kind of blunt stick, really, mm. isn't it? And also sometimes in a rare number of cases, we will say, and it really depends, you know, you, you can't go into this kind of like willy nilly and a, apply a blanket rule, but in a rare number of cases will say, you might want to give the stalker a little bit of information because if they're suddenly cut off from you, they are going to have a really, really hectic reaction and they're going to go absolutely wild with rage. Mm. So gen as a general policy, let's ignore, mm. but horses for courses. Yeah, especially with that public figure or the, the non-ex-partner stalker, it's a, it's a more valid... Uh, it's a more valid one anyway, well, yeah. I guess from a, thinking about it from, from the lens of, uh, of a bodyguard or a, or a, protection, a protective detail, yeah, uh, at, at least uh, not letting them have contact with the principal, at the least, or not letting the principal answer the phone or not letting the principal actually engage with them. Um, which actually leads me to a, an interesting question. I think it, it probably came up in one form or another about at what point do you notify the police? I mean, does, does a police, does a law enforcement intervention make things worse, especially if the police aren't in a position to do anything because no laws have been broken yet? How do you manage that kind of question? When do you involve the police in a stalking case? So tricky because some research I did a couple of years ago, oh, I think it was the best part of 2,000 people um, I spoke to that had been stalked and I found out that on average, a hundred stalking events, behaviors, you know, phone calls, following threats, all different stuff. Average case, a hundred things had happened before the person even realized that this was actually stalking. And what that tells us is that usually by the time people even think about getting the police involved, it probably is already entrenched. Mm. But we tell people, generally speaking, to trust their instincts. You know, risk assessments and, you know, there's a whole industry around that. But, you know, they're all great. There's some fantastic tools out there. But the research does show as well that nothing is a better risk assessment than the human brain. Mm. And the human brain is the person that's experiencing it. Mm. We tell people, trust your instincts. If you think this is really bad, if it's giving you the proper shivers, if you've got a real dark feeling about this, then go to the police. Simple as that. You know, we don't say wait till 11 incidents, three of which must have been a threat. And we do say to people, have a quick look at the legislation where you live, because you'll be you might be pretty surprised. I think it's New South Wales. Um, might have to look this up. I might be wrong. Somewhere in Australia, I think it's New South Wales. Their legislation allows for things like staring. 
So if you've got a handful of occasions where the stalker's like, you know, sent you a couple of messages, been there when they shouldn't, you go, you're going to Coles or Woolworths, but they're uncannily always there in a different suburb, staring at you. There you go. People are often surprised about what, what they might perceive as a relatively low threshold, but you've got to trust your instinct. You know, be thankful for the billions of years of evolution that's got your brain this well developed. Trust that mm. rather than a bit of paper or, you know, some advice from somebody else. No, mm. uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a good tip. Uh, and I mean, look, we, we talk about that in every other form of self-protection, every other, every other concept, we, every other context, we tell people to uh, you know, trust your intuition and listen to those, those warning signs and trust that your subconscious is picking up on patterns you may not be consciously aware of. We, we yeah, talk about stuff. At- exactly that. Um, so, but I think it's sometimes because of because the stalking attack is kind of more removed. It's not immediate. It's it's at a distance. Yeah, it's chronic and as well, and that's the thing. Overthink it, right? You can overthink it. You can you've got time to play it out in your head and talk yourself out of different courses of action, and uh, and that can be a problem. Uh, one thing I wanted to circle back to that we we sort of glossed over at the beginning, and, and this is hard because we are talking about very different typologies, in, in, and, and we're switching between them. So hopefully people can follow, uh, mm. but. Um, one thing that uh, shout out to Mary Stevens in the UK, former guest of the show, and does some great work with uh, with uh, some vulnerable women in, in India. Oh, in India, Mary, yeah, she's fantastic. She is. Um, she uh, she asked about, I guess, those early warning signs that someone may have stalking tendencies. So maybe not warning signs that, the, that they're already stalking; they're going to make it worse. But obviously, if we're talking about ex partners, these are people that we have chosen to be in a relationship with, or we've ended up in a relationship with, one way or another. Uh, so are there any sort of behavioral indicators before the stalking starts that you may be talking to someone, flirting with someone, courting somebody that is not going to be able to hear no <laughs> and, and, and maybe an issue later on? Yeah, big time boundaries. People that just don't seem to respect boundaries, either yours or the other people that they engage with. You know, so say, I don't know, say you're a student and you start in a relationship with a fellow student and they just don't seem to have boundaries with other people, right? Uh, that person over there, that student, the other student, a third student that we barely know, they're really, 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 really good at this topic. Let's go and ask them for all the questions. Let's get their phone number and I'll badger them incessantly and they'll help me with my homework. That entitlement and utter, utter lack of boundaries. And for some of the people as well, like this extreme neediness from day one, Because so many of the people that became victims that I've spoken to over the years, they said, I was the only person that was really bloody nice and polite to this person that became my stalker. And it's this whole trap of just being a nice, polite and decent person. So you're standing there thinking, I feel really uncomfortable. I really, really don't like dealing or talking to this person. But because I've been brought up by my lovely mum and dad to be a really, really nice, polite and decent person, I'm going to put up with it and I'm going to nod and smile and be polite. Boom. You could have been the only person that's been nice to that person in ages and bang, they got their claws into you. But in a relationship, we tend to see a huge acceleration really early in the relationship as well. You know, this love bombing. So say, for instance, sorry to Mrs. Saunders for this, um, you know, hypothetical situation, but say that, you know, I take an interest with you and I look up all things about you and I tell you that you're great and you're really flattered and you eventually agree that we go on a little date and then I'm doing everything, I'm paying I'm just giving you these wild levels of compliments. I'm text messaging you all the time, telling you that everything that's great about you. And, you know, I'm making all these fantastic plans and just every breath I breathe is all about Joe. It's all fantastic. And this love bombing is a really, really, really bad sign because some people, especially young people, they don't know any better. And, you know, the kind of idealized notions of romantic love that are all around you know, in the stories, in media, particularly, well, in all societies, actually, you know, that's what everybody wants. They want this beautiful, you know, romance where you're swept off your feet. But the research absolutely shows us that this is a really bad sign. People that won't take it slow. Mm. You know, you you actually just reminded me of a a story I've I've been trying to weave in because it was the first person I knew uh, that had been stalked, uh, yeah. a girl I went to, went to university with. And what you described is almost exactly what happened. She, really? 
first year first year university 18 years old really pretty girl uh, yeah. absolutely lovely just a sweetheart great yeah family, just a lovely human being and uh she um happened to be nice to a guy who was a bit socially awkward and um yeah, not a very attractive guy and was kind of shunned and was a loner and didn't have yeah. friends and and he struck up a conversation or they struck up a conversation and she was nice to him and she was nice to everybody but he really took that as a sign that uh, she was like the first attractive girl that had ever been nice to him. Yeah, ever. And just and that was it. Boom. For, for for months, uh, and would bring her gifts every like every every time they they crossed paths. He'd have a gift for her. He'd bring her something new. He'd, he wanted to invite her to things, and she kept trying to find polite ways out, but never really told him no because she didn't want to hurt his feelings. And because she was became, lovely, yeah. yeah. It just became this ongoing thing where she was actually terrified and started changing her her schedule, changing her classes, trying to avoid him. And uh, and I remember we we went to a movie uh, or we watched a movie at a friend's house, and it was I forget which movie it was, but it was one of those teenage romance comedy type deals, right? Where the guy gets rejected by the girl. And yeah, then yeah, yeah. persists and persists and shows up at her house and does all these cute and funny things. And she was terrified. She, she left during the movie and she's like, that see, like that's, in, in yeah. Hollywood, that is how you win a girl. Uh, yeah. But in reality, that's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy the way we're kind of, uh, and look, I don't know anything about this guy. I don't know what, he, what the result was. I don't know whether he had any issues, whether he had any history uh but whether he's still doing it now who knows yeah, but, but maybe yeah. he was just so socially stunted that he just was following the script from the, the media he'd consumed yeah because you- we do see yeah. that yeah you know in a particular brand of people not just blokes um females as well you know people with these very very I'd say socially stunted traits and they do everything as the script but then they can get really, really dangerous because all of the kind of romantic emotions and needs and their self-esteem and everything that they've ever wanted is caught up now in this relationship that doesn't exa- actually exist, but they'll think that it does. That's okay. my girlfriend. Right. I guess yeah. they, start, they start living in the fantasy world and when that gets ripped away from them, it's, it's, it's actually the same as a, a real heartbreak, but... It's exactly. It's, it's identical. And then it turns to betrayal and then it can get incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And they themselves can often kind of swing on a daily, even hourly basis between I love her. We're going to have the perfect relationship. It's just all these other bad idiots, you know, putting stupid stories in her head and keeping us apart mm. right up to, well, you know, if I can't have her, then nobody else can. I kind of hate that phrase, but some of them do actually think that way. And, you know, so therefore I'm just going to always show up. I'm going to be there. I'm just going to prevent anybody else getting nearer. And as we know, in some cases, it can go even further beyond that. They can develop a catathymic rage, what we call a catathymic rage, and it can end up in a fatality. Mm, mm. Speaking of, um, of escalations, uh, what are the, I mean, we've, we've sort of talked some about some of the red flags with, with the stalking and which ones may turn violent, which ones may end up being uh, more uh, more dangerous, I guess. But uh, what, what sort of percentage of stalkers do you think? I mean, I know, I know I'm, I'm asking a percentage to an academic, so that we're, this, this is a really painful question for you to answer. <laughs> yeah, could go on for about four hours, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to cause you physical pain to guess. Uh, but but also, what sort of percentage of stalkers actually do end up resorting to violence if left unchecked? Is it? A lot. It's about one in four. But really? then oh. when, yeah, but then when you think it's about one in four, one in five women worldwide will experience stalking and about one in 16 to one in 20 men. And then you work it out from there, about one in four are actually violent. It's a lot of violence in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really fascinating. I did not think it was going to be that high. No, nobody does. Cause if you do things like look at the official stats, you know, back to the old stats and percentages again, that police forces keep, you'll see that there's not that many stalker cases associated with violence. Why is that? Because it doesn't get charged at stalk- as stalking. And we all knew this, but about, I thought, I don't know what it was now, two or three years ago, my lovely friends at the Western Australia Police Force gave me all their stalking data just because they're lovely, lovely people, all of it. So thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of cases. 
and we saw that only a few of things charged as stalking were associated with violence. But when we looked at the narratives, you know, when the police officers go along and he writes down or she writes down or they write down all the stuff, you know, um, in this case, we had you know, a fender driving down this street and did this, this, this. And we saw in the narratives clear evidence of stalking. You can't imagine how long it took to do this, all the words. <laughs> words and words and words and words and words, about 50 billion years probably, We're only slightly exaggerating. But when we looked at the narratives, we found thousands and thousands and thousands of cases of stalking, right? Mm. But hardly any of them were prosecuted as stalking. They were prosecuted as murders. They were prosecuted as child abduction, mm. as dangerous driving, as breaking and entering. I published a paper on it somewhere a couple of years ago, and I, I put this big list at the end, you know, what people were prosecuted as and um, what they actually did. And some of these were incredibly dangerous people that did loads and loads of horrible crimes, but not once were they charged with stalking. And this is the issue because it's so interrelated to all of the crimes and so difficult to define. And this is why we have a problem identifying and talking about it. Was that because they weren't known to police until they committed the the end crime, the murder or the, the break and enter, or was it just because they it was documented but they just weren't charged? It was normally um, that they were charged with something else because the problem is that a lot of the behaviours that make up stalking, some of them on their own are not remotely illegal. Some of them are radically illegal, like murdering somebody, for instance, or sexually assaulting somebody. So we go for the ones with a bigger charge. Yeah, of course, yeah. Because then yeah. it's easier to get them locked up. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that makes sense, but it doesn't, doesn't help the data, does it? <laughs> no, not at all. No. Not at all. Mm. Is, well, another interesting question that came up was about gender differences. Uh, yeah. so, so maybe there's, there's a couple of different threads to pull on there between the difference between male and female stalkers and also maybe the difference between male and female victims and, and how that experience might differ. Uh, and then I'm sure we could probably go even deeper in the weeds between uh, yeah, ex-partners of the same sex, ex-partners of opposite sex. Oh, big time, yeah. But what, what are some of the interesting differences there that, like, if you had to give a summary? Generally speaking, women are more likely to be stalked than men, and men are more likely to be stalkers than men. But that masks an awful lot of variance. The intensity of the stalking tends to be the same. Doesn't matter if it's male to male, female to female, female to male, or male to female, or whatever. The intensity and the levels of violence are very, very, very similar. Male stalkers and female victims is when we're more likely to see the most severe and often the most often fatal violence. But generally, kind of frequency of violence is pretty similar between genders and across genders. It used to be thought for a long, long time that men were way less likely to report stalking than women. But now we're seeing that men are only a little bit less likely to report stalking than women are. And in terms of the behaviours that male and female stalkers target towards each other, not radically dissimilar. So there's some differences, but not a huge amount. And we tend to see that there's more ex-partner stalkers that are male and more stranger and acquaintance stalkers that are female. So the motivations do differ. So there are some important differences. That's really interesting. Yeah. The males are way more into, you know, the rejection and the narcissistic injury. Mm -hmm. And the females are more into imagined slight and insisting that we do actually have a relationship or should have a relationship when there wasn't actually one. Mm, mm. Yeah. You just mentioned the word imagine slights and I just, uh, I've, I've got four daughters and my life is just all about imagine slights at the moment. Uh, but How uh, do you deal with that? That's impossible. They're all, they're all little and I have a very understanding wife. Uh, oh, teenage, that's lovely. teenage years are coming. Uh, but um, You're going to die. It's all over. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to be told that by a forensic psychologist. Uh, but um, 
Uh, I'm I'm curious though. You said you said the uh, there was heightened violence or higher levels of violence between with, with a male stalker and a female victim. Would you? Would you more have, severe uh, violence. Severe so violence. the same number, the same frequency of violence. Violence. They they engage in violence at similar rates, but the the males are more likely to engage in lethal and incredibly severe violence. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm wondering whether that has something to do with the psychology of a a male that, that stalks a female, whether the the, uh, the heightened rejection sensitivity because of a power imbalance or a sense of entitlement, or whether that whether there's societal factors there, or is it is it uh, is it is it purely physiological that a that a male attacking a woman's more likely to do serious damage than the opposite way around? Um, any any thoughts on on why that why that trend is is apparent? I choose D, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Option D, so yeah, I mean, yeah, we've got the, we've got the kind of like, it reflects what we know about other forms of interpersonal violence between males and females, such as family violence. So we do know that a lot of kind of like situational family violence, just everyday family violence, you know, not the absolute worst kind, pretty equal between females and males, but the more severe and lethal violence, more likely to be males towards females, but not always. Not always. So, yeah, it reflects those. So I think it's a mix of physiology, uh, what society tells you to do as a rejected male rather than a rejected female. Yes, yeah. all of the above. There's not quite as much Netflix and, uh, and, and ice cream culture with rejected men. <laughs> no. It's almost like you're supposed to be angry or you're supposed to act out and go do something masculine to, to get over it because you shouldn't have feelings in the first place. Um, exactly that. Yeah, I mean, life would be a lot, a lot better, generally speaking, around the world, wouldn't it, if everybody reacted to bad things with ice cream and Netflix? <laughs> just, That's what we should promote with the Managing uh, Violence podcast. I'm gonna need to get, maybe I need to get Netflix as a sponsor first, and we can promote that as a as a go to strategy. Exactly, uh, and ice cream <laughs> manufacturers. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm curious about also about the the side of, uh, I, I guess, take acts of violence against third parties, whether that's pets, whether it's you know, maybe the destruction of property, like meaningful property, or even acts of violence against children. Is there is there any sort of typology there or, or any trends between gender there or, or, or I guess flags that someone may decide to act out against another entity uh, in that person's life as opposed to the victim themselves? Strangely enough, um, there's a few studies out there and Although they're a bit mixed, it does look like in some, in some cases, women are more likely to be violent against pets, female stalkers. Interesting. It is. Where, and female stalkers are also more likely to attack children. And again, it might be a physiological thing. Mm. If I can't hurt the man who is bigger and stronger and may have better weapons and stuff, maybe I will hurt the dog or the child because that's easier for me to do so. Mm. I mean, we see that in, in, in domestic violence and family violence, as you said, where there's a, you know, rather than being an overt attack on a, on a person, it might be destruction of a sentimental object, or it might be, you know, burning something that has, that has value or emotional value as a way of sort of, exerting that control over someone's mental health and well-being or taking away something that they feel is uh, a distraction from from their love for yeah, their oppressor or their abuser yeah. so uh, but yeah I, I was curious because I, I I think I've seen that as well with with uh, female uh, aggressors when it comes to domestic violence and more inclination towards that as well uh, look we, there, we've we've covered so many different things and this, this is an unusually disjointed podcast because normally i just kind of let the conversation flow but i had so many great questions i wanted to get to that we haven't really got a a, a, a logical flow <laughs> but, um, but that, that's the way i operate anyway i never have a logical flow <laughs> I, was, uh, I i had a um I had an interview uh, maybe a year ago with a guy named Jeff Thompson. I don't know if you you know Jeff. Or, oh yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, so I interviewed Jeff, and I I idolized Jeff for fifteen years, big time. And he'd, I'm actually getting to meet him in a couple of weeks in uh, in Coventry, so I'm super. No, excited. you're not. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. I'm super excited to go do that. But uh, Coventry is not very nice. Don't get excited about Coventry. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm I'm, I'm I'm doing a keynote in Blackpool a couple of weeks later, so that'll be that'll be 
Lovely. Again, you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> no, you won't. It's fine. Shout out, shout out to people coming to see me in Coventry and Blackpool. You've got a lovely town. Uh, but um, They are great places. They are genuinely. They're, 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 they're challenging places, but they are full of fantastic people. And they're a great laugh and they've got good pubs. So, yeah, I'd go. <laughs> You've, you've you've made up for it. you haven't killed my tour that's fine yeah. uh, but um but no when i was when i was interviewing jeff uh i basically spent like a week writing notes and notes and pages and pages of notes because he had barely done any media for about 10 years and i was one of the first interviews wow. again and i didn't want to screw it up and then i just i literally said hello to jeff and then we i, I think i got a second question in about 45 minutes later so <laughs> <laughs> lovely I mean, you can, it's a stream of consciousness with him um, i love it i love it I want to circle back and, and, and I think probably just to, as we're closing out on the main interview, um, just to just to try and give some really practical tips that, that can help people, whether they are in a situation where they feel like they might be uh, dating someone with stalking tendencies or whether there's they've got concerns about somebody in their friend's life or their daughter's life or their child's life or whatever, right? Um, what are some of the things that people can do if they... I guess probably from the first side, if they feel like they they are being stalked, uh, what are some things they should do? And secondly, if you are worried about someone that is in a loved one's life and you think it's going to go pear shaped, what we need to do straight away is to get some detail and or encourage the person we're worried about to really think it through. Because remember what I was on about earlier, most people, there's at least a hundred dodgy things happen before they even entertain the idea that what's happening is actually stalking. So you got to get him to try and join the dots. So why do you feel that things are not quite right? I just do. But what have they actually done? Um, it's probably nothing, but I think I saw them in Coles and then in Woolworths and then at the Optus Stadium in Perth. And I think that they've been hanging around my university and my work. OK, start writing that down. Ask for any kind of evidence as well, you know. Write that down, keep a log. Because like I say, the really, really, really big thing is to join the dots. So we've got to document every single action. And that not only is good from an evidential perspective, but it's also fantastic to try and get an idea of what's going on so that we can tell the person we suspect may have a problem or they the self suspects there may be a problem to really think about it and put it in some kind of context and any evidence right from day one as soon as possible is fantastic screenshot things from twitter facebook identify usernames accounts and again, you know, I can't say it strongly enough, this complete statement, why are you worried? What are you worried about? What are you finding? And make it clear to people that huge amounts of what stalkers do, the individual behaviours are not remotely illegal. They're fine. They're totally legal. They're mundane. But it's only when they add them together, which is why we've got to keep all the information huge, 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 huge amounts of information. And if we say things to people like, oh, are you being stalked? That's not going to elicit a lot of good information because there's not really good shared language around stalking the way there is fortunately around family violence these days. People won't really know what we mean. A lot of people can't define it because it's tricky. So instead of saying, oh, are you being stalked? We say things like, how are you feeling when you wake up in the morning? What's the first thing that comes into your mind? What are other people saying about this person? If this was happening to a friend and they described it to you, what would you tell them? What would your verdict be in terms of what's going on? So we've got to try and get people to articulate all these little unrelated things into a coherent picture. Does that answer the question? I've actually forgot what it was. Yeah, no, that, that's a, that's a really great way of, I guess, building the awareness of what what's going on. Is it a problem? Uh, yeah. And and again, to to harken back to something we said right at the beginning about trusting your intuition. And Always. I think that sometimes the challenge we have with intuition is that because it is subconscious or, or 
yeah, unconscious, depending on perspective. But because it's it's not conscious, we can't articulate it. We don't know why we feel the way we do. If we did, it wouldn't be intuition anymore. Exactly. Like we, we want to we want to argue with ourselves. Like we're the only animal on the planet that wants to write an essay about every decision we make. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, that so yeah, no essays. A soundbite. What do you think? Mm. Do you what, think this is good or bad? Yeah. Bad. Okay, that will do. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's brilliant. Uh, and what, one last question, because I, I would be remiss not to mention it. Um, there's uh, so so I'm sure nearly every guest I've ever had has recommended you're, you're in the bonus content we ask you for book recommendations but uh, I'm sure nearly every guest has mentioned The Gift of Fear by Gavin De Becker at some point it was certainly the first person that put me down Damn right it's down excellent a, a yeah. system, fantastic book um, he has a very strong opinion that um, that uh, apprehended violence orders AVOs or uh, restraining orders or whatever they're called in your your jurisdiction are basically useless because they're a slip of paper that don't help. Um, for a lot of people, that's their default first response. And if they go talk to the police about a, about a stalker issue, that will usually be a, the police first suggestion is get is get an AVO or get a restraining order put on yeah. them. If someone is, well, f- firstly, do you think they're useful? Uh, but secondly, if the person's in a in a jurisdiction where maybe law enforcement support is not very helpful, uh, because I know we have listeners from all over the world where maybe. Yeah. The police should not be are not going to be helpful in that situation. What are some of the things? Firstly, are, is that piece of paper useful in most situations? And secondly, if you're in a situation where you can't go to the police or the police aren't going to be able to provide you any sort of solutions, what are some of the things you can do as an individual to make yourself a bit safer? Okay, I agree with the find at Gavin D. Becker and Gavin De Becker's gang that they are essentially useless because they will be breached and breached. However. If you live in a jurisdiction where people, where the police take them seriously, it gives police the opportunity to make an arrest and it adds to your case. It strengthens your case. So therefore, I would say they were worthwhile. And yeah, I often advise people that live in places where stalking is not even illegal. Mm -hmm. So I say lots of things to them. I say it's all very difficult to prove. So again, you've got to keep as much evidence. And remember what I was on about before, stalkers, particularly when they escalate, will often be charged with something entirely different. Dangerous driving, breaking and entering, all kinds of stuff, because they're doing this stuff as part of the stalking. Also, I would say to people, boost your security. I mean, people used to talk so much about the difference between stalking and cyber stalking. And in many ways, it's an artificial distinction because you can't really have a stalking case in the modern age without an element of cyber stalking. Good thing about that is though it leaves a better trail of evidence. So adjust your social media privacy settings, change your passwords, and then out of cyberspace, alter your routines, ask people to accompany you, meet with experts for personalized safety advice. There's great people all around the world who will, via um, victim-focused websites, help you construct a safety plan. If people don't know what a safety plan is, it's a bit like, remember you were at school when you used to get the fire drill, And, you know, it's like, what are you going to do in the fire drill? And if you did those at school, you know, you've got to leave your bag and your beloved pencil case behind and get out into a particular bit of the playground. But a safety plan is the same kind of thing. It's like a mental shortcut. So you, when you're in a crisis, you know what to do. So, okay, I see my stalker and I'm out in the centre of the town. My safety plan says I should go to a big public place like the supermarket, the library, if I can't get anywhere near the police station. What does my safety plan do at home if the stalker comes in? Oh, it tells me to use these verbal de-escalation techniques. It tells me to put a towel up by the window so that my neighbor knows the stalker's here. You know, all these wonderful little shortcuts. And I'd also say people need to be aware of what stalkers are capable of because they can engage in this for hours, weeks, years. I worked on a case, Joe, that lasted for 43 years. I've worked on hundreds of cases that have lasted more than 10 years. Be really alert, I'd say to people, on on unusual events, on communications, and don't underestimate what stalkers can be capable of. You know, I'd say to people, think about your own life. You know, you've got four kids. How many hours a week do you spend on them? Ridiculous amounts. 
Do you ever get a chance to see your wife? Do you spend time with her? How much time do you spend cleaning the house? Ridiculous amounts. You've got four kids. How much time do you spend working? Ridiculous amounts because you do all different fantastic stuff. How many times do you spend working out, training? Be aware a stalker can spend all those hours, all that time, all that effort just into stalking one person. So do not underestimate them. That is a very powerful point to leave the main interview on. So uh, I know you're going to stick around and do some bonus content in just a minute, but uh, for those of us that, or those that, that are going to be uh, jumping off at this point, Lorraine, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to someone who is truly a world leading expert in a topic we have not touched yet, which is, which is really super cool. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, Lorraine and I are going to be working together on a few projects coming forward. Yeah. You'll probably hear her back on the podcast again, assume, assuming uh, she uh, had a good time this time. Uh, so I did. If you do have follow-up questions, feel free to jump jump in the Managing Violence Tribe Facebook group. Uh, Lorraine's a member there, so she, she might answer it for you there, or we might do another show. So it uh, depends entirely on what the feedback is. But uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lorraine Sheridan. Thank you, Joe. You're the best. Thanks a million.